going to talk today about seven millimeters specifically a bit larger K seven millimeters for shooting our big game. And this really all started coming about was in nineteen sixty one. When my great friend Les Bowman saw the need to have a 7mm caliber rifle with a large enough case capacity for the powders that we had at the time to shoot elk reliably out to around 500 yards with a 160 grain bullet going around 3,150 feet a second. Now I've done a piece in the past on the development of the 7mm Remington Magnum. I'm not going to go into all of those details, but that, this was the original intent, velocity-wise, to get right at 1,800 foot-pounds of residual remaining edge energy at 500 yards. In those days, about the only powder that we had that would do this was Hyson's 4831. And this is how this was loaded by Les Bowman back many years ago. And of course, Encouraging by Les the Remington to come up with this cartridge. They came out with it in 1962. And being fairly close to Les, I thought that I needed one. I was shooting a 300 H&H &H Magnum for my longer, a little bit longer range elk hunting. And so the latter part of 1964, I bought a Herder's U9 FN Mauser type barrel action. That barrel action cost me $98. Complete barrel action made in Yugoslavia with a high grade blue. Just a beautiful barrel action with a decent trigger, a good action that fed properly, and so forth. I bought that, and at the same time, I sent off to Robert Roberts Wood Products in Marysville, California, and I had them send me a semi inleted eye comb rollover curly maple gunstock blank and I stocked that rifle with that beautiful blank. It was a striking striking piece of wood. It was solid solid curls from one end to the other in that blank. 1965 October 1965 I shot my first elk with the 7 millimeter Remington Magnum and all shots were less than 150 yards. I spotted the elk from around 600 and some odd yards away, and I got closer. Now, emphasize that I got closer. And at that time, what I could get my hands on at the time were 140 grain Sierra flat base bullets. Loaded with 4831, traveling something over 3,200 feet a second. Now, Les and I chronographed these loads on his just about then newly introduced Avtron chronograph. And for years and years, that's what we did all of our all of our testing with using this Avtron chronograph. Now. Right off 
I had very, very poor results with the 7mm Remington Magnum. I also had poor results on, on a buck deer with the same, with the same load. Yes, I killed the elk. Yes, I killed the deer. By the way, it took five shots to get the elk killed, and they were all, all good hits in, in the vital area. Same way with the deer. I shot the deer actually with one shot, and it traveled quite a ways before I ever, ever found it. And so I was a bit disappointed with this situation. I immediately did some checking. And I came up with 175 grain Hornady bullets. And I loaded my rifle with those bullets and I loaded a hunter's rifle with 175 grain Hornady interlocks. Now these bullets would only go just right at about 2,900 feet a second. But this is a far, far better load at 2,900 feet a second than these other bullets. And I've emphasized all along in my videos, irregardless of the range, is the proper the proper bullets for the proper situation. Well since that length of time, we've come a tremendous ways to do with a lot of powders that are desirable to load for the then developed 7mm Remington Magnum and other cartridges. And as I used that, that rifle for several years, I came up with the determination that the way to go was a 175 grain bullet, but I, I needed even more velocity than what the 7mm Remington Magnum was capable of. Well, coming ahead quite a ways, because of the situation, because of what I was doing, working, and one thing or another, I finally found time to build myself a rifle on a larger case capacity in a larger case capacity round in seven millimeter calibers to specifically shoot 175 grain bullets. And in this period of time, I experimented with my 7 Remington Magnum with 175 grain bullets, 175 Hornadies, 175 Nosler partitions. And I didn't find anything wanting, you know, other than the fact that it didn't have enough initial velocity for downrange breaking energy to kill elk like I thought it ought to kill elk. I got to understand that at the same time I was using a 300 H and H Magnum, eventually rechambered to 300 Weatherby, and so I damn well knew what it took, striking energy wise, the the remaining residual energy downrange and out there around 500 yards. I wasn't shooting anything past hardly 500 yards whatsoever. Well, I took the 300 Winchester Magnum case and I necked it to 7 millimeter. And basically, in doing so, I increased the length of the neck. So I had a little bit more of the neck length. I ended up with, with a neck that was 3 tenths of an inch long. And I had a 45 degree shoulder on an improved 300 Winchester, 7 millimeter by 300 Winchester. Now this, this immediately became just hands down in every way, shape, and form much better cartridge for killing elk at any distance that was reasonable. That, that cartridge would do 3,200 feet a second with 175 grain bullets. And I used that rifle quite a bit. And actually, I eventually wore the barrel out on that rifle and I rebarreled it. And 
I rebarreled it. When I rebarreled it, I rebarreled it again, of course, to 7 by 300 Winchester Magnum improved of my, of my design. I made the reamers for the chambering. I made the reamers for the dies and the whole works, you see, because I was doing a tremendous amount of tool and die work, you know, previous to this. And I was in a situation where I could find that kind of time to be able to do these things. And in within a year, within a year after using that rifle, I had a yearning to even have a rifle with even a little bit more case case capacity. And one of the reasons being is that now there was a powder that was available. It was a military pull-down 50 BMG powder, and it was designated WC-860, Winchester Cartridge Company, WC-860. And I, I got a hold of 100 pounds of this powder for $100. And that's what I loaded in my 7x300 Winchester, and then the new cartridge that I developed and designed and made all the, the tooling for reamers for chambering and, 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 and for dies. The 7 millimeter by 404 Wapiti Express. What year was that? And this was, this was in 1984. I finished the rifle in 1984. And at the same time I was building rifles for, for, for friends and neighbors and people from other parts of the country. I was building rifles for 7x300 Winchester Improved, 7x7mm seven by, seven by 404 Wapiti Express. One of my friends at that time, once a year, he would go, he would go to the SHOT Show. And he became quite familiar with the then ballistician for Nosler, a man by the name of Gail Root. And in that, in these in these contacts, he encouraged Gail Root from Nosler to come out with a 175 grain Nosler partition in Spitzer design. Of what they'd been making for years was a semi Spitzer, but this was an outstanding bullet. It really lacked absolutely nothing. So then Nosler made a run of these bullets. For testing, and he and I were provided 150 of those bullets for testing. We tested these bullets out of nine rifles, nine rifles, all the way from a seven millimeter 08 to the seven millimeter by 404 Wapiti Express. This friend of mine's rifle was a seven millimeter by 300 Winchester. And he did quite a bit of shooting along with my, the shooting that I did, independent of him, but we always compared our notes and everything. And here's, here's where I'm headed with this. We wanted to find out exactly what benefit there was the Spitzer bullet over the semi Spitzer bullet. Well, this friend of mine picked up a box of 175 grain spear grand slams, picked up a box of 175 grain hornadies. We had 175 grain Nosler semi spitzers. We had these newly newly made short run of 175 Nosler spitzers, and he shot his rifle at 100 yards, and he was shooting. He specifically shot three shot groups with all four of those bullets at 100 yards with four, four, four brands of 175 grain, one seven millimeters. That rifle shot a five eight inch group at 100 yards with three of each of those bullets. Now that is outstanding accuracy. The rifle would shoot right at three tenths with a specific bullet. So basically what I'm telling you is the impact was virtually the same. A composite group 
of those four bullets was five eighths of an inch at 100 yards. Set up a target, measured it with a bar and stroud, military rangefinder, set up a target at 700 yards. We had figured out what the drop value was and so forth. And he sat down and he shot two rounds of each bullet at 700 yards, holding at the same place on the target. He recovered the target. The target measured four and three quarter inches for those rounds shot with all four of those bullets at 700 yards. Now, according to the testing then and the information that we had, the designation for all of those bullets varied by a hundred points in ballistics coefficient. It was then and there that we pretty much started ignoring ballistics coefficient because it had, had no value whatsoever. If you can shoot a four and three quarter inch group with four brands of bullets of the same weight with the same powder charge and get that kind of accuracy at 700 yards, where in the hell is the ballistics coefficient? It simply did not matter. However, we were precision shooters. We had wonderfully accurate rifles that I built. And we continued to do some of this testing. At that time, Sierra, if you gave them your information of your loads, Velocity-wise, your sight in your sight in height at 100 yards, they would give you computer printout information out to a thousand yards or whatever the situation was at hand. Well, we did exactly that, and Sierra continued to do this for many years until smart Alex came along that seemed to think that they know it all and started to tell a, a bullet company who knew more about it than anybody else in the business. They were trying to tell Sierra their business that they didn't know what they were talking about. Now basically here's where I'm headed with this. It was determined by Sierra back then that over that distance the ballistics coefficient of those bullets changed a minimum of three times over that distance. Now, if the ballistics coefficient changed, this actually changed some of the actual trajectories and how these bullets reacted. So, anyway, <clears throat> I'm going to go on and explain here. We've had for many, many years quite a number of cartridges that were large capacity cartridges. Starting out many years ago with P.O. Ackley taking the 300 H&H in, in, in 30 caliber and 7 millimeter caliber and necking that, you know, to, to, those, to those calibers and improving it, basically a case that was the same capacity pretty much as the 300 Weatherby. So we had... A th a 300 Ackley Magnum, a 7 millimeter Ackley Magnum long, you see, and another man from Oklahoma by the name of Art Mashburn, he was doing the same sort of thing. And my, one of my wonderful instructors, gunsmithing instructors at Trinidad Junior College, <coughs> Warren Red Key, he worked for Art Mashburn as a gunsmith before he became an instructor at Trinidad State Junior College and retired quite a number of years after I was educated there in this situation. So I was connected fairly, fairly decently, being very close to Les Bowman, having been to gunsmithing school, having been around this, this man, Red Key, and so forth. And I always learned more from all these these people than anybody else was 
because I had an intense want to learn, want to know, and at the same time doing all this testing myself. These are the, all of the things that led to me to designing these cartridges because I just love to hunt elk and other game, and I love the 7mm round. But what's happened here in the past few years is we've regressed. We've come quite a ways. You know, now we've got the so-called 7mm PRC. Well, this, is, this, folks, is going to basically be a flop. It was the flop first time around, and it's going to be a flop the second time around. They took the 300 PRC case and necked it to 7 millimeter and pushed the shoulder back for less case capacity. How stupid do you get? You need a case with a big capacity. The proper thing to have done is take the 300 PRC and necked it to 7 millimeter. Then they would have had a decent round. And fact is, I did exactly this when, when Ruger came out with the 375 Ruger. I necked it to 7 millimeter and shot 175 and 160 grain nozzle partitions and 100 and 175 grain nozzle partitions out of that would do 31 and a quarter. Now we've got a 7 millimeter PRC that won't do just but hardly 2900 feet a second in a standard length action. Another stupid move. You don't put the cartridge of this nature on a standard length action. You need a long magnum action to seat your bullets out where, the, where they belong. This is the only way that it can be done. This is all about energy. Now the comment has been made that this 7 millimeter PRC is a 900 yard elk cartridge. Like hell it is. At 2,900 feet a second, the so-called 175 grain Hornet EADL-X bullet, which is the poorest designed bullet for game, perhaps, that's ever come down the pike, but everybody keeps, keeps gravitating towards these EDL-X bullets. They're poorly designed, they're thin jacketed, they're not capable of doing the job. You use bullets that are designed for the job, certainly not those bullets. And by the way, the remaining energy at 900 yards is only 12, about 1,265 feet of foot-pounds of energy. Well, this is the other aspect. The whiz kids, I call them, the know-it-alls, that think that they know the story, that have never been there and done it like I have and shot many, many dozens of elk out there in the six, 700-yard neighborhood, They've never shot an elk at 900 yards, but by damn, they call it a 900-yard elk rifle. Well, they've abandoned, first they abandoned the energy values and in, in replacing that with ballistics coefficient. Now, ballistics coefficients don't kill game. It is the proper design bullet, the energy, and the sectional density that does the job. You can have the sectional density and the ballistics coefficient, but if you don't have the bullet design, it won't do the job. They've got away from 1,800 foot-pounds of minimal energy, dropped it down the first time around when they come up with some of these other things, down to around 1,500 foot-pounds of remaining energy. Now they're around, down to around 1,265 Foot pounds of remaining energy. This is hardly enough to kill a mule deer and, and hit it properly. And my point is, this does not have enough energy to do what needs to be done. This shouldn't be, this shouldn't be going on. This extreme distance shooting shouldn't be going on at all. You know, this is my point. We've got cartridges out here that'll do the job. The 7 millimeter STW came along about 18 years after I developed the 7 millimeter 404 Wapiti Express, it has the same case capacity. It was used originally by Mary Louise Devoto in 1,000-yard competition in 1962. 
shooting 168 grain Sierra Match King's bullets at 1,000 yards. This was a true 1,000 yard rifle. It shot something like about a 7, a 7 and 11 16 inch group for 10 shots at 1,000 yards. It won. That should have told people something. That was 3,200 and like 65 feet a second that that bullet was running. I just, I just said what the velocity was of that 168 grain Sierra Match King. I'm not encouraging anybody to use a 168 grain Sierra Match King 7 millimeter bullet at any damn velocity to shoot any game anywhere because they're target bullets. Just like all these burger bullets are nothing but target bullets. They're hollow point thin jacketed target bullets. And this EDLX bullet is nothing but a thin jacketed target bullet. The wrong thing to do. The very best bullet out here for the se the, the seven millimeter is 175 grain nozzle partition. Oh yeah, I know it doesn't have the Blixis coefficient. All you have to do to do with bullet Blixis coefficient value is adjust everything according to the drop values. It's that easy, folks. You see, it's just as easy to adjust for, for one Blissey's coefficient as it is for another Blissey's coefficient, if that's what the hell that you're hung up on. But what you need to be hung up on is the energy. And you need to be hung up on ethics. The ethics have been completely thrown out. And we've got people that have never shot an elk at 900 yards, probably never will, telling us all about it. Well, I can tell you about it. Because I've been there, I've done it, and I've been doing it for years and years and years. And I've done it with all these cartridges. I have numerous 7 millimeter by 300 Weatherby's. I have seven, several 7 millimeter by 404 Wapiti Expresses. I've shot all of these, all these rounds over the years. Built literally hundreds of them. I don't think that there's anybody that has the experience that I have with all these seven millimeters for taking game. I am an intestine experimenter. I experiment all the time. I develop loads for hundreds and hundreds of rifles. Actually now, over thousands and thousands of rifles over time. And I know what works. I've been there. I've seen it. I've done it. But I just absolutely cannot understand why Folks aren't paying attention to what the real facts are. I don't put out anything but what the facts are. These are the facts. These bullets will not do the job. And by the way, if you want a long range elk rifle, you sure as hell don't pick one in 7 millimeter or 30 caliber that's only going to do about 2,900 feet a second. Where it really begins, folks, is at about 3,200 feet a second, starting out velocity. You've got to have that kind of velocity to end up with the downrange energy that you're looking for, whether you're shooting at five or six or 700 or 1,000 yards. You need the energy. Although you're not advocating 1,000-yard elk shots. I'm not advocating 1,000-yard elk shots. I don't shoot elk at a thousand yards and I'm not going to attempt to shoot elk at a thousand yards. I figured out many, many years ago what these things were all about. I'm a hunter. And as I build all of these things over an entire lifetime, and I have some of the equipment that most people would just drool over in the way of rifles and so forth, as I have gotten further along in my hunting career and my gun building career, I have found that it's seldom that I have to shoot anything past about 400 yards. In fact, is most everything is shot inside of 400 yards, maybe, maybe 100 yards. There's a lot more hunting involved, shooting game, regardless of what it is, at closer distance. So, how in the world 
do we take a cartridge and basically duplicate the 7 millimeter PRC is almost an exact duplicate ballistically to a 7 millimeter Remington Magnum. How is this going to work? It's not going to work. It didn't work as a 7 millimeter Remington Magnum. It wasn't intended to work past about 500 yards. That wasn't the intent, and the intent of less. His intent was in the game country hunted and so forth. And he had numerous rifles, provided clients and one thing another over the years when he was in the outfitting business, hunted some of the greatest country on the face of this earth for elk. The country that he hunted, the country that I hunt is just damn near gone for elk. And, but now here we are. We've lost our game. We've lost our opportunities. But we got almost everybody that there is trying to promote these things, which are entirely unreasonable. We've got publishers of, of, of gun magazines encouraging this nonsense. We've got bullet companies, all to do with money, encouraging everybody to shoot at these long distances. If you want to shoot at these long distances, have a target rifle built and sit down on a bench properly sandbagged with your target rifle and shoot to your heart's content at a paper or a steel target. But forget it when it comes to shooting out there at this long, long range. It's pretty tough for anybody, really, to shoot something at 500 yards and it's beyond reason even be shooting or attempting to shoot at anything at a thousand yards under hunting conditions and everything that's involved. Everything that I've been explaining over the years and in, uh, in other my videos and in this video, we have to have the remaining energy and the proper bullet designs. Now in 7 millimeter I suggest 168 grain nozzle long range acubons, 175 grain nozzle long range acubons, and 175 grain nozzle partitions and 175 grain Hornady interlocks, 175 grain spear grand slams, and one thing another. And these real thin jacketed bullets are designed to open at extremely long range. Well, there's a huge, huge trade off. At three and four hundred yards, these bullets open quite violently and cause a lot of damage. And they, yeah, there's some a tremendous amount of terminal terminal effect. Too damn much. And in, in fact, the bullet performed much better out at further distance because of the thin jacket design of the front of the bullet. These bullets will do the job, but you're going to go and Suck up to this idea of buying one of these so-called out-of-the-bark thousand-yard rifles and go out here and wound a majestic bull elk or majestic bighorn, bighorn sheep ram or what have you, or maybe somebody even shooting at grizzlies at this distance. At grizzlies? Oh, man. It's just gotten completely out of hand. We've got this going on, too. This is absolutely ridiculous. This is one of the most dangerous animals, you see, on, on the North American continent. By the way, we are, are so overrun with grizzlies that almost everybody that's hunting is seeing more grizzlies and more sign than they are hunting elk or deer or bighorn sheep. There's far more grizzlies than there are elk. But we're hunting elk, you see, in this grizzly country. This is also another poor situation. Going to explain something. You cannot simply go out here in this part of the country and 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 try to pull off one of these stunts and shoot an elk out there at a thousand yards. I'll guarantee you in the country where I live, here in Wyoming, and all across Wyoming in elk in, in the in the remaining elk country that we have, you will have a grizzly, or maybe three or four grizzlies 
on that elk before you get ever get to it a thousand yards away. It might take you an hour, hour and a half to get a thousand yards in some of this hunting country. These bears are smart to this. And when they hear a gunshot, they home in on it. Not only do they hear gunshots, but these bear hear the bullet impacting game. First, they hear the sound of the rifle going off, the muzzle blast that's put out into the atmosphere, and when that bullet strikes, that might be 100 or 200 yards from that elk that's standing there that you're shooting at, and those grizzlies hear that bullet strike, strike that elk. They can smell the blood from a long way away. And the grizzly can smell blood, smell fresh blood, even day old blood or week old blood from miles away. And so now, let's say that you just you just you just shot a you just shot a, a bull elk at somewhere out there at extreme range, and you're going in, and you and your guide, maybe a companion or two, maybe your wife, maybe your child. Maybe your, maybe your young 16-year-old boy is along with you on the hunt, and you all get charged. You want to get killed by a grizzly bear because you're so stupid to shoot something at this distance? It's bad enough shooting it at two or 300 yards. We have many instances here where the hunter gets there two or 300 yards away to the elk that he just killed, and a grizzly's already recovered it. Well... According to Wyoming law and according to the protection of these bears, you see, you can't, you can't take that elk from the bear. You're not going to take the elk from the bear because the bear's not going to let you. The bear's going to eat you and he's going to kill you. Now this is where these things have all went. And you can't get another elk. And you can't get another elk tag. You're never going to get another elk tag. I don't care what you do. I don't care how much money you got or what your attitude is. So... This is my latest information on this. I'm telling it like it is.